having skirted around and met Syrians through lots of MSF work around the Mediterranean, in Calais, in Jordan, in Lebanon. Actually, I finally got into Syria last month. Uh, six weeks ago, I got back uh, where I was working in Raqqa, in North Syria. And you arrive, and of course, it's not just a drive into town. There are bunkers, there are blown up vehicles, there are blown up bridges, there are danger landmine signs everywhere. You get the feeling that you are far away from anywhere, behind lots of checkpoints in a zone that has clearly seen a lot of destruction recently. And it's a little bit eerie. It reminded me of Haiti. It reminded me of Haiti after the earthquake where that level of destruction, that many buildings lying in rubbles across an entire expanse of the city. But it's just that much more sinister because it was much more complete. The destruction of Raqqa, just anecdotally looking as you drive through compared to what I saw in port au -Prince, was much more complete and not a natural disaster. So it's sinister. Very soon after the end of the offensive, by November the 18th, MSF was in there, and selected a house that hadn't been destroyed. You can put three trolleys, you know, if you have expertise and you have materials, you can do quite a lot in a room, quite a lot. There are landmines and improvised explosive devices strewn across the city, the remnants of war, um, other things in other explosive devices intentionally placed there to cause injury. Others that are landmines that were, were originally part of defensive fortifications or just unexploded bombs that have fallen from an aircraft and if you touch it, they go. And the staff that I joined were telling me in those first uh, two, three weeks, you, you'd hear them go off constantly and, and they'd think, right, we're going to get some cases soon. So we're getting seven, on average, seven, almost eight cases a, a day. And you're talking, uh, you know, hand amputations, bilateral leg amputations, blown off, civilians being trucked in through the rubble. It's a level, I am told, a level of, um, uh, of sort of mining or, or imp you know, improvised explosive devices that's not been seen ever before. And it's in a civilian uh, center and it's in under beds, in kitchen shelves, on the streets. It's everywhere, everywhere. We were told one story of how one of these mines was on such a delay that the, the, uh, the family member, the man had come home, checked everything was fine family had moved in, uh, he called them and, or, or, or you know, got them to come, gone back to the camp, brought them. And um, then a mine went off, so it must have been on a delayed timer, long enough to, such that days had passed. They're not packaged, There's, we don't have x-rays, uh, we don't have blood tests. It's a very different scenario. That's a not insignificant journey for someone who's just had both their legs blown off. They, they won't survive that. And if they've survived getting through the rubble to our little house in Raqqa, they've already got quite a good chance of surviving, but we need to ensure they will survive that two and a half hours. And someone who's got two legs blown off will not. One such case arrived and he was really very close. I couldn't feel his pulse, put it that way but he was still breathing. I mean, he was quite literally in that window where you can't, there isn't quite enough blood left in your system that you can feel their pulse, but he's just about got enough blood in his system that's getting to the brain that's, and he is breathing. I mean, you're talking probably three, five breaths left before you die. I mean, it's, it's literally just that moment. I think if any one of, one of us wasn't there at that moment, by chance, that he wouldn't have survived. He was very, very, very lucky. And we gave um, 
you know, four units of blood, three litres of fluids were applied to tourniquets, lots of painkillers, anaesthetic, mm, washed out everything, dressed it so that to minimise any, any excess bleeding and, and, and shipped him out. Um, and we, he was so critical that normally we don't send uh, one of the doctors as an escort because there's usually only one doctor in shift and then there'd be me and one backup. So, but we actually sent a doctor on escort for him just to make sure that he arrived at his destination and he did.